Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. All right. All right, the reveal. Will it mat my hair down since I came out of the shower? Not bad. Okay. Uh, let's go. How to drink in the tea tank. Or drink tea in the tank. The tank museum. Jeez, I just woke up, okay? Let's go. Original link to the video, top of the description, right below that. Link to the Discord. Click on it, sent right over there. Thanks for the recommendation. If you want me to... It's easier for me to interact with you and see your recommendations uh, when you're on the Discord, but it's up to you. I... Let's go. I've learned in the mornings when I... I'm like, ooh, that wasn't a good intro. You never start. You just gotta start. No matter how bad the intro was, just get back. Go. Strange title. Hello, I'm James Holland, and I'm a historian of the Second World War. And I'm Richard Cutland. For the past eight years, I've worked for World of Tanks, but for 30 years before that, I was a tank crewman with the Royal Tank Regiment. Now, here at Bovington, we're always being asked all manner of questions, so we thought we'd sit down and try and answer some of them. Therefore, welcome to a brand new series, How To In A Tank. This video is sponsored by the free-to-play online game of World of Tanks. Guys, make sure if this interests you to use their uh, link. Uh, the original link to this video, tap the description, then use their link for the uh, promo codes and helps them out. Deserve. World of Tanks is a multiplayer PC game where you can take control of history's most powerful machines and enjoy tactical player versus player bad, bad. gameplay. Download the game at the link below. Use the invite code for an exclusive starter kit. Well, if there's one thing the British love, it's a good cup of tea. And as a former tank commander, I couldn't agree more. We all loved, as a crew, getting together and having a brew. And the British Army thought it was so important that from 1945 yeah, onwards, they actually put onboard brewing facilities inside the turret. So, funnily enough, in this particular episode, we're going to look at how to make tea in a tank. Now, of course, the soldiers in the First World War didn't have the relative comforts that we had on Challenger 2. <laughs> no, it's all pretty basic stuff here. But the little creature comfort you get is from the Tommy Cooker, which you're now going to try and get to work, Richard. They're ingenious, aren't they? Because they're tiny, and you've got... You, so you take the lid off, which you've done, you pierce this, and it's just, it's just kind of some flammable gel. Then you've got your mess tin, two enamel mugs. Yes, yeah, so that, that's still the thing it is now. Like when you go camping, it's just like a blue gel that... And that's a World War One tank, right? They look even more terrifying. Carnation milk. And of course you want carnation milk because of course that's what keeps it, you know, from going off. Tinned milk. Plenty of sugar, bag of tea, pour it all together. And you're good to go. And this nice really sounded like that. It has, it has lit. It has lit. Don't use lead to seal your canned goods. What was his name? Franklin Expedition. There you it's go. Absolutely. Lit. That's amazing. Okay, so we've got to get this. <laughs> okay, it's fine. It's fine. Um, well, let's just hope that the soldiers in the First World War were a lot better at doing this than we were. Okay, <laughs> let's just. <laughs> Guys, it, can... it might not be the best for health and safety, but you know, <laughs> being in the Western Front's not great for health and safety. Let's true, face yeah, it. This is very true. Are you going to put it straight into the pot? Deary me, the look at me. Look at that. Oh, look at the hue yeah. that is turning. That's going to be absolutely a thing of wonder. That looks delicious already, James. The steam's coming off it. It's beginning to bubble. It's time to pour it in. A little bit for me, a little bit for you. Drop of milk for you. I'm going to put the lid back on. <laughs> so this is how you do You just get rid of it like that. Boom. And obviously we need a bit of sugar, don't we? <laughs> Two for me, please. Two for you. Yeah. <laughs> nice tell you. sweet. <laughs> If that, um, if this thing gets wet, um, would it, I, I'd imagine, would it still work? That, that seems like such a great thing to have in any survival situ scenario. I wonder what it takes to make it not work. And the, obviously we need a bit of sugar, don't we? Two for me, please. Two for you. Yeah. <laughs> I can, nice tell you sweet. I can tell you you're in the army. 
it's like custard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's it's not it's not milk as you and I would normally know it. And we both got. There you go, James. Cheers. A Looks incredibly milk. tasty. Mmm. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> actually, I think I, I actually that, that's that's hitting the spot for me. I'm absolutely fine with that. It's actually better than I was anticipating. Oh really? Yeah. Tea first. Really this is uh, room temperature, kind of cold. Uh, black coffee with no cream and no sugar. Kind of how I drink it. He comes to, to Britain in the 18th century and, and really takes a hold. And by the 19th century, it's absolutely kind of part of the daily ritual. I mean, what you've got to remember with the First World War is, is that you know, a lot of the the, the, um, the water was coming from kind of sort of cans that have been cleaned up by the use of chlorine or by petrol. So the water you're getting is pretty ropey. It's obviously one of the reasons why you want to kind of, sort of boil it up as much as you possibly can. So whatever your tea tastes like, it's going to have that kind of residual kind of flavour of chlorine or fuel. Funny enough, you know, some British soldiers did have thermos flasks as well, which of course, ironically, were designed and built by the Germans. How do you get enough heat to make a brew very quickly and then get rid of it again really quickly. The genius about this is you can light it. You know, we, we lit this in a, in a gale. Um, immediately put it out again and, and put it in your back pocket and you, and you have a sack and off you That's go. That's awesome you? And do you think, I mean, was every single soldier issue one of these? No, they weren't. They weren't standard issue, actually, which is... I'm in the... I am, right? I didn't go to Brown, by the way. I don't want to act like I'm, I'm trying to pose as someone who is smart. Which I was not. No, I, I'm learning, but I'm in. It's a bit, you know, right there. That's good. Is it, which is weird because they, they flipping well should have been. I mean, they're absolutely amazing. Um, but the problem is, it's less sort of, you know, I mean, it doesn't give off much of a flame, does it? So, Which is good from a tactical scenario, from a tactical point. Yeah, um, but you just don't want to be kind of faffing around trying to sort of light fires with bits of soggy wood, do you? Yeah, absolutely. You just, you just want instant heat, switch it off again. They had that in The interesting thing about the tank, though, is, you know, inside there, I mean, that is Hot brutal. Because the fumes inside this thing are just toxic in the extreme so for obvious reasons you don't really want to be kind of setting light to a tommy cooker inside it but of course even today i mean you know soldiers are soldiers and i guarantee you no matter what anybody says or anything you read that at some stages they would brew up inside that vehicle i'm sure you're right i'm sure you're right and i think people what's terrifying about early planes or early tanks like and what is so terrifying about terrifying about world war one being a soldier in world war one not that it wouldn't have been in any other war, but that clearly uh, these new mechanical, you know, planes and um, tanks for combat, they're, they're essentially prototypes of, of later, like safety is not the number one concern in terms of this. It's getting a battlefield edge over the Germans in a way you can go over barbed wire and over trenches and not get stuck and hide behind for your infantry to have moving cover. And so any sort of comfort inside of the tank is not priority, which would be even more terrifying for, for people being the guinea pigs. Stages, they would brew up inside that. Got to do I'm it, I'm sure though. you're right. I'm sure you're right. And I think people underestimate the importance of it. I mean, even today, when we run operations, there is, it is so critical. It's a, you all get together as a crew, you sit down, and you have a couple of seconds or a, a few minutes, hopefully, off from everything that's going on, all the chaos, yep. uh, and you can sit down and actually have a nice hot cup of tea. I mean, even in Iraq, where it was baking hot, of course, we would still be drinking hot brews. It's a very British thing to do, isn't it? Yeah. So, that's the First World War. Now, World War II and the Sherman tank. Let's go. American tank. So we've left the First World War behind and now we're on to the Second World War. And there were a number of different ways in which you could brew up in World War II. Guys, 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 so, so was the Sherman tank not necessarily like the best tank, but it was just very mass produced. And so that was the beauty of it that I really don't know what I'm talking about. I, I'm phrasing this as a question, I hope. Uh, I am. I hope it sounds like it. Of It might not have been like the best tank one-on-one -on -one with other tanks, but they were mass-assembled, mass-produced, and like were easily fixed and stuff like that. Is that the main reason that the Sherman was great? 
Or was it good as a tank on its own, too? You could have your Primus, and there were a number of different ways in which you could brew up in World War II. You could have your Primus stove, you could make your own fire, or you could have a Benghazi burner, which is what we've gone for here. So you pour it in the fuel, light the match, and just drop it in, Richard. There we go. You're all right. Still got eyebrows. Still got eyebrows. Here's our mess tin. Before. Well, don't drop it in like... <laughs> hmm. Ah. <laughs> Water. Do you know the great thing about this is, though, James, is also gives you a bit of visual. Like, unlike I the know. Tommy cooker that we had before, this is fantastic. And soldiers like you nothing more. You can sit more. around it, can't Yeah, you? absolutely. It's right. a proper campfire. Now, during the Second World War, you still have loose tea, you still have your carnation milk, but you also had composite tea. And it has to be said, you know, it wasn't as, uh, it wasn't as popular as ordinary tea. I'm assuming that's a, that's a mixture of it all then. It's all together. Yeah. It's a one Sorry, what were those wooden logs for again? Were they for putting in front of it? Stop shop. Yeah, it's... Ah, uh, uh, ADD. I'm assuming that's a, that's a mixture of it all then. It's all together. Yeah. It's a one-stop shop. Yeah, it certainly is. And it looks absolutely disgusting. It looks already. horrible, doesn't it? Look at that. So that is, <laughs> that is dry tea, dried milk. Oh God, it's got horrible little bits in it. I'll tell you what, where this is where you really do need your sugar as well. Stir it all in. I've got to say that does look absolutely gopping. Looks like gravy. So we've also got some boiled sweets here, and this is a story from Kent Out. Now, Kent Out was in the Northamptonshire Yeomanry, um, served in Normandy and beyond, and he's a lovely fellow. He's an absolutely top bloke. But he used to say that he often used to put a boiled sweet in there as well. Now I'm going to... Gee, even today we get boiled sweets in Do you? ration packs, but I've never heard of it being put in tea before. Boiled sweets? So it must have been pretty hefty on uh, water, though, boiled James. Sweet. I mean, it takes a lot of water to make a cup of tea all the time, and uh, yep. there's only a limited amount of water that you actually carry on a vehicle. And obviously, the, the important thing is making sure that you keep the coolant system topped up as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, water's always a problem. I mean, less so, obviously, in, in Northwest Europe, where you've got lots of rivers and all the rest of it. But yeah, you know, in the desert, it's, it's an absolute nightmare. One of the things they used to do in the desert, they used to put, um, because the, the water bowsers were kind of very obvious, they look like little tankers, yeah, you know, yeah. with c cylinders on the back, you know, giant cylinders on the back. So what they used to do was put a canvas cover over it and quite often put a red cross on top as well, just to kind of really kind of prove the point. And again, you have that whole thing that you absolutely had in the First World War of, you, you know, your water tasted of petrol, it tasted of chlorine, it was all pretty disgusting, really. And I can't emphasise enough how disgusting that actually It doesn't look great, does it? But we're going we're gonna to sample it now. Same. I'm going to give you a little bit anyway, Richard. I'm looking forward to this. Um, but actually, one thing that's very interesting, that does look pretty like a, hot, though. Like a much. chai. Uh, one thing that's very interesting is in 1942, it's probably the nadir of, of, of the British Army's fortunes, in certainly in the war in the West, where they've lost the Gazala battles, they've just had to kind of flee from Tobruk in June 1942, and they're in full retreat back to the Alamein line. And morale is absolutely rock bottom at this moment. And I heard it said that at that moment, had it not been for the tea ration coming through, we could have easily kind of thrown in the towel. I mean, that is how important tea was to the British Tommy. And I can appreciate that, you know, it sounds amazing. Now, I always wondered, you know, I know how, you know, it's, it's been a taste over time, but how, you know, an acquired thing over time for the British, but the Boston Tea Party, like, oh, we just threw a bunch of tea in? Now I know why that angered you guys so much. I mean, the amount of times that we have been super cold, absolutely drenched to the skin on exercise or operations, and to have something like this is just incredible. And of course, you can't underestimate the fact that, you know, it may seem nice to sit around a fire with a cup of tea, but it's also incredibly oh. good for the crew. It makes you perform better, it wakens you up a bit. Yep. It's, um, you know, it's really, oh, really important. Anyway, I'm going to try this tea. Yeah, I'll tell you what, it's, it's not quite as bad as it looks. <laughs> I'll tell you what. Before I get their reaction, let me just uh, make sure I put an upload up for you guys. Sorry, we're good. It's it's not quite as bad as it looks. <laughs> I tell you what it tastes of. You know, about sort of 15, 20 years ago, you, you know, if you were going to a public place, you need you'd have your sort of 50p, and you'd have a little sort of horrible little plastic cup of tea that would come out of the machine. That's what this tastes like. And of course, there's a reason why it tastes like that because that's exactly what it is. Isn't it? <laughs> no, I have to say though, with with stacks of sugar, it's still pretty good. And to be fair, just I feel like I'd be glad just to have hot water. And it's uh, it, it's all right, isn't it? It warms you up. 
Yeah. So just as important in the Second World War as it was in the first. Absolutely. So we are inside the turret, Challenger yeah. 1 turret, uh, second tank that I served on. Um, so welcome. See, now is the tea maker in the tank. This is what I'm talking about, the, the comforts. Um, yeah, and we're here obviously to look at the tea making facilities on there. Yes. Uh, and you'll Progress. notice, just to your left there, it's not actually in the right position at the moment. It should be further down. There's a bracket down there for it. Is the boiling vessel, the BV as we refer to it as. Um, and, and the British Army loves acronyms, doesn't it? Oh, of course, absolutely. And I have mm. to say, you ask any tank crew and it is the singularly most important piece of equipment <laughs> on the entire tank. Forget about everything else. Forget about armor, protection, firepower, mobility. Forget about it all. The BV is the singularly most important thing. So you don't have this in a, in a Russian tank or an American tank? It was the British who invented this. Now, a few other countries <laughs> have actually stolen the idea, and I've seen some similar things around there, but certainly no. And again, I think you can't never underestimate the importance of crew comfort in the turret. You can see there, you know, we used to spend sometimes days inside this turret. Um, so there's a have that ability there to run the BV to get your hot water was fantastic and I think it's also important to mention that you know it was we we've now seen World War One we've now seen World War Two but here you go here's an item that we can have running 24 7 as long as the GUE the generating right. unit engine or the main engine was running to charge to provide power for it and it would boil water but of course on top of that it wasn't just the tea we could put tins inside there you could put yeah. packets of food so it was your one-stop shop just question anyone who I'm amazed by the amount of people who, you know, have commented and have had certain experience, but anyone been in the armies? I feel like even recently, well, recently, I'm sure the tanks are better, but was being, do you guys know if being in a tank was an enviable, like I, at sometimes I'm like, Ooh, you're in, you're in a moving armor protected thing oh it's nice it's better than being a soldier but then you're also stuck in an iron thing that might make you feel like you know you're a big target for anti-tank missiles and and airplanes and so you're kind of you're a more obvious target that's going to be more valuable to hit yet you're protected by a lot of armor and so it's like w would you want to be in the tank would you want to be infantry instead just from a safety point of view for absolutely everything so using the a bag kind of food this was the thing i mean unless especially on operations you don't have time to stop and get everything out and get the cooker out and all the rest of it so that was the thing that did everything for you and it was an absolute lifesaver and where you are at the moment you're on the loader side of the fighting compartment he was the man who was well as being responsible for loading the main armament doing the radio uh two i see of the yeah. tank as well yeah. he was also more importantly critically responsible for making a nice cup of tea for us all <laughs> But um, yeah, and I think we should mention probably the thing below it actually is called the brew box, believe it or not. And no. surprise, surprise, oh, that's where you would keep inside there. That's where you keep your mugs. That's where you keep your tea bags. And not enamel um, mugs. We always, always, always had China mugs because a cup of tea just doesn't taste the same unless it's in. When a did a you mug turn into an insult? China mug. Always, always had China mugs because a cup of tea just doesn't taste the same unless it's in a China mug. <laughs> um, but yeah, the positioning down there, it yeah. wasn't left there all the time because, of course, what would happen was when the gun fires, you can see the breach here of the main armament. Yes. If the gun fires, if you were to keep the BV in position, what happens is that little white handle down there, it's called the rammer handle, yes. would actually smash straight through there. So, of course, on operations uh, and also on range periods, it would be moved out of the way. And it seems like you guys should just get rid of the T thing. It's not worth having in there. I, I guess you have to be British to understand. Tucked away somewhere. But what I love about this, Richard. Yeah, but for me, oh, that could get in the way. Get rid of the T thing. Right next to here, we've got the thermal observation and gunnery site. Okay, that that's here. Next to it is the BV, your kettle, which looks basically exactly the same. Now let's jump outside so it's a bit easier for everybody to see. <laughs> It's one of the most British things I've ever seen. So, Richard, obviously, you're kind of normally brewing up inside the turret. In a good way. So, how does this work? You lift it up. Yeah, so, I mean, obviously, Ooh. getting it outside of it. I think the important thing to mention, first of all, is obviously what you would need was the power lead, which is yeah. conspicuous by its absence. Having said that, though, we did have on our tank, you could get, actually make yourself and it, a, a longer extension lead. So, oh, really? theoretically, you could get outside of there. So, you notice inside here, there's actually an insert. Well, we used to bin these because it was just, you could get more water in there and it would boil yeah. quicker. So, we used yeah. to get rid of that. And there you go. And that really is as simple of it. The element inside there, yeah. throw the water inside there 
there, put the lid back on, and then wait for it to boil. And wait for it to boil, and it, it will boil when it's super clip. It doesn't whistle, but what it does do, funny you should say that though, um, there's a bit of a, obviously you get a lot of pressure built up in there, so you can tell when it's boiling nicely, you just get steam bellowing out wow. of, the, the, of the top here. So that's it, it's as simple as that, whatever era it was, the facts of how really important, I mean we take it quite lightheartedly, but it is critical to, yeah. you know, a tank soldier, it is there, it's that great feeling, it's when you're cold, it's something to warm you up, it's getting together as a crew, um, you know, it's a real necessity. I cannot think in my 30 years of service on tanks what life would have been like <laughs> without having a cup of tea. A BV, well, that's a, a new one for me. So now, James, having drunk all that tea, of course, we now come on to the problem of how to go to the toilet in a tank. A question I'm asked a huge amount. <laughs> well, should we leave that for another episode? If this video hey. has gotten you in the mood for some tanking, don't forget to... You just pee out the back or... ...to check out Word of Tanks at the link below. The invite code will give you a Matilda Black Prince, seven days of premium account, and a T3485... And it'll make them know that this is the people that sent you there. So, win-win. Love you guys. Hope you enjoyed that. Hope you learned something or can teach me something down in the comments. And I will see you guys next time. All right? Bye, guys.